Hello, I'm Baidik Bhattacharya, and on behalf of CSDS, I welcome you all to today's talk. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Naomi S. Barron is Professor Emerita of Linguistics at American University, Washington, DC. She's a former Guggenheim Fellow, Fulbright Fellow, and visiting scholar at the Stanford Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. For more than 30 years, she has been studying the effects of technology on language, including the ways we speak, read, write, and think. Her earlier books include Always On, Language in an Online and Mobile World, 2008, and Words on Screen, The Fate of Reading in a Digital World, 2015. Her newest book is How We Read Now, Strategic Choices for Print, Screen, and Audio, which came out in 2021. The title for her talk today is When Reading Goes Digital, Questions of Medium and Mindset. Professor Baron, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Bodek, and good evening to you all. What I'd like to do with you today is share some of the thinking that I've been doing both over the years and more recently on what happens when we read and does the technology on which we do our reading shape how we process, how we think about, how much we care about what we're reading. And I'd like to contrast that issue of the technology with what happens in our minds in terms of the presuppositions we make about how that technology might be affecting how we read. Let me, if you will, share my screen and um, it's a dreaded PowerPoint, but here we go. When reading goes digital. So questions of medium and mindset. I'd like to begin with a quotation that in some ways sums up the mindset that a lot of people had, oh, 10 years ago now about how print was going to go away. And essentially we were all only going to be reading digitally. Uh, the quotation from is, is from a man named Ben Horowitz, who's co-founder of a venture capital company. And this is what he said at a conference in October 2012 in California. Babies born today will probably never read anything in print. It's 10 years on and those 10 year olds, I bet you are still reading some print. So that was one of these overblown statements and that's what people do to get eyeballs in the media. Uh, but there are other overblown statements as well, and I'd like to, out of fairness, contextualize some of them. In the research that's going on now um, on comparing how we comprehend when we read in print versus read digitally, uh, there are a number of people who are talking these days, some of my dear friends and colleagues, as a matter of fact, about what they call screen inferiority. Basically saying, if you're reading on a digital screen, it's inferior to reading in print. Well, is that universally true? Is it true for the kinds of controlled comprehension studies that they were doing? Um, it's actually the latter. And we need to be mindful about how we weigh the kinds of uh, dire declarations that people make. In that context, I think it's very important to look at how people, uh, what I'll call vote with their feet, and they, what do they do? when it comes to making choices of reading medium? Uh, what do they purchase? Um, what do they prefer, even if they end up purchasing something else? So for example, my students tell me, I would prefer to read print, but it's too expensive. So therefore I actually get the digital versions, at least for textbooks. And now my screen doesn't wanna move. My slides don't wanna move. Very weird. Okay, here we go. Um, there's been a lot of discussion over the years, but particularly when um, ebooks first started becoming prominent at the end of the 2000s on what's called the content versus container debate. That is, does it matter what medium you're reading in, or is it just the content, the words um, that matter? So whether it's written on newsprint, whether it's written um, in the Gutenberg Bible, <laughs> whether it's in the newsprint then, uh, oh, that sort of was. 
um, whether it's written digitally, it doesn't matter, it's the words that count. And that was what a number of people argued when they were basically arguing that digital books were gonna make no difference in terms of how we read, how we absorbed, how we enjoyed and so forth. There were also a lot of people saying to those who said, but I like print. Um, the people who were saying digital is actually pretty good began saying, oh, you print people, it's just habit, you're being sentimental and um, you'll get over it at some point. But then you would talk with people who were even doing a lot of digital reading and they'd tell you what they liked about print, that they didn't really want it to completely go away. So it's a very nuanced story. For that reason, it's interesting, uh, and I've spent the last decade or so working on this, to do actual research and to find out what we know about how people comprehend when they're reading in different media. But also, and this is where my own research has been, to look at their perceptions, their thinking about how they read in different media. I, I mentioned in, on the slide um, uh, the issue of calibration studies, which is on kind of a cross um, between a comprehension study and a perception study. Because what calibration studies do, and I'll talk about them in, in a few minutes, is they ask, how do you think you're gonna perform, say on a comprehension test, before you actually take the test in one medium digital or another medium print? And then you look at how you actually performed. Or you can take the test and then say, how do you think you performed? But I'm not showing you the results yet. And we'll find some really interesting mismatches between people's perceptions of how they comprehend in reading on different media and what the actual scores show. Okay, let's just step back in time a little bit and trace, uh, and forgive me, it's only from the American perspective, it's where I have <laughs> the statistics. Um, look at what was happening with eBooks um, in their trajectory. The Amazon Kindle was launched in November, 2007. And Relatively soon thereafter, and it was about a year or two, um, the sales, and I put sales on purchase in quotation marks because you're not actually buying an ebook, you are leasing it. Um, but as far as you're concerned, you've paid good money for it and you think it's yours in some virtual sense. Um, the sales in the United States skyrocketed, and there was triple digit uh, growth for a number of years. And it was in that context that people kept saying people aren't going to read books anymore. Um, the container is irrelevant. It's just the content that matters. But then things started leveling off around 2014. And that maintained the case, uh, maintained to be the case until uh, the pandemic. So what happened is around 2014, there were sudden plummets in the, and I'll call them sales for, for convenience sake, in the sales of digital books. So it was dropping 20%, 30% a year. And then by about 2018, it was leveling off to dropping, it meaning purchases of ebooks, um, was leveling off to dropping about 4% a year in 2018, 2019. These statistics, by the way, come from the major association of American publishers called the Association of American Publishers which tracks around 1,200 American publishers and their sales in various categories. Come the pandemic, we didn't get much choice. We internationally, not just in the United States, um, as to how we procured reading material. And there was a surge, not surprisingly, in eBooks. And I'll just mention uh, in terms of the kinds of things that the Association of American Publishers tracks, this was both in um, trade books for adults as well as um, what's called children um, YA or young adults, um, I guess essentially trade books. And everything was digital because that's what we had. But in what I'll call late, later pandemic, because we don't know when we're really done with this thing, um, by late spring of 2021, that is a smidge more than a year ago, you suddenly started seeing a decline in digital sales and a rise back in print. So if you wanna talk about people voting with their feet, it was pretty clear that at least for the American public, there's a continuing appetite for print books. Let me turn to the um, educational sector because I think that's a huge part of the story. Uh, again, I'll speak largely for the United States, but uh, it's gonna spread if it hasn't already. 
And I'll begin with the Great Recession and backtrack to about 2007 and a man by the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, we're not talking about him in his bodybuilding phase. We're not talking about him in his B-grade movie phase. We're talking about him when he was governor of the state of California. Uh, we elect strange people <laughs> to, to political positions. And what um, he argued for, because the California state budget was broke, they had no money, they couldn't afford to buy textbooks. He said, we have to start using digital books. But, you know, Amazon Kindle was just starting up, so he wasn't really talking about that. There, there had been digital books prior to the Kindle. Um, and he said, we, we've got to create these things. We've got to use them. We've got to make them free because we cannot afford to buy textbooks for our students. There's another movement that's very big in the United States, but has some outposts in other parts of the world as well, called Open Educational Resources. And this has been a movement um, that is overwhelmingly digital in character. In principle, you can print some things out, but outside of lower school education, almost no one does. Um, and the goal was to make textbooks available to wide ranges of audiences, both lower school, um, middle school and high school, as well as university students. Uh, as, I, as I'm sure you know, in the United States, higher education is deathly expensive. And when you add textbooks to that, it becomes um, impossible for many people to pay the bills. So the object was to make open educational resources available at all levels, including to university students, which is the context I know best. Meanwhile, the publishers, who still wanted to make money, thank you, um, not to offer things for free, because open meant free. Uh, the publishers were busy saying, you know what? We can make more money with digital than we can with print, which statistically is true. So the company Pearson, which makes a huge number of textbooks, particularly kindergarten through high school, uh, but some college as well, um, about two, two, no, it's now three years ago, uh, adopted a policy called digital first saying all our textbooks are first gonna come out in digital. And if we think there's a market, we'll do some print as well, but we're not gonna update print very often because people aren't buying it anyway because it's too expensive. There was another move from a, a whole consortium, well, not a consortium, it was a group of publishers, but in essence, they acted as a consortium um, for a program they called Inclusive Access, um, which isn't as pleasant as it sounds, rather it's cornering the market saying, we're gonna make available all the textbooks that we publish for one low price at the beginning of each semester. This is for university students. And you pay that one price and you get your digital books for a fraction of the price you would pay if you got them in print or if you were to rent them, because many students rent um, both print and digital, but we're talking about a digital here, for a lower price than if you were to access them, rent them or purchase them uh, individually. And this is sweeping the country because people don't have money and we're now, thanks to the pandemic, used to more and more digital reading. All right. The pandemic, and again, I'll speak largely for what I know about the United States, but I'll also reference some schools, um, some international schools um, for secondary school students where I've been doing some research with colleagues that I'll be talking about shortly. What happened in the pandemic is learning went virtual. And that meant that the materials that people were reading were overwhelmingly digital. And schools, as a way of trying to make materials available, suddenly shifted all their, their budgets to buying digital resources. That included their library budget. So included buying, buying print, they bought things that were digital. And I can be grateful for this because I needed some of those books in my own institution. Um, the other thing that happened is although a number of us who have been doing research for many years now are very um, confident in our conclusions about the effects of digital materials on learning, parenthesis, not always good. If you tried to talk, and parenthesis, if you tried to talk with schools about the need to think carefully before they only use digital materials for learning, their minds were appropriately elsewhere. It was a question of student safety. Can they come to school? If so, should there be mask mandates? They weren't worrying about what's in the curriculum and they weren't worried about print versus digital. And hopefully in the later pandemic, come endemic, we'll be able to change that. Okay. In thinking about questions of medium versus mindset, it's also important to remember that not every reader 
and not every culture approaches different reading media the same way. So let's begin with individuals. Uh, it's often said, and statistically it's true, that the vast majority of people do not concentrate as well, and I'll show you some statistics soon, do not concentrate as well, do not remember, do not learn as well, and so forth, with digital reading as they do with print. However, some people are able to concentrate really well. And the person who comes to mind, uh, because so many stories have been told about her, is Marie Curie. Um, you know, there could be uh, fireworks going off and she'd still be working, it wouldn't phase her. But that's not true for most of us. So we, though for some. Then there's a the question of why are we reading? So it's, it's a different issue if you're reading for the purpose of learning that you really want to remember, that you want to reflect, that you want to engage in what Marianne Wolf um, and others have called deep reading. That's a fraught term, but for the moment I'll let it stand. You know, to really focus, reflect, compare what you're reading now with what you knew before. That's different from reading a thriller at night before you go to sleep or when you're uh, waiting at an airport or on a plane, or sitting at the United States on a beach. Okay, there also is the question of what kind of prior experience you have with focusing on your reading, with concentrating. So uh, two books ago, when I was doing some uh, radio call-in shows, there'd be people who would say, I concentrate perfectly well in reading on my Amazon Kindle, okay, or on my Kobo, or whichever kind of e-reader you're using. And then I'd listen to them. And it was pretty clear, although I didn't see their faces, that they had been reading for probably 60, 70 decades. <laughs> um, these were people who knew how to read, who weren't necessarily getting distracted. They were also reading on devices um, that didn't necessarily have status updates pinging at them all the time. And then there are questions of personal preferences. So there's some people who just really love to read digitally. And there's some people who really love to read in print. And there's some people who can read on either. So we're, we're different as people, and we have to remember that rather than making broad generalizations about everything. It's also important to think about cultural differences. When uh, digital book sales were soaring triple digit year over year in the United States, the sales in countries such as Germany and France and Italy uh, were paltry. There was very little digital reading, and some of that can be traced to attitudes towards the books reverence towards the book, um, reading culture, the cultures that read a lot more than Americans do. Um, so it has to look at cultural context. And maybe we can talk about the situation in India and the growth of, of ebooks in India, because there are also other um, motivations for using one medium versus another versus cultural sense of, of the importance of print. And that is economic realities. What can you afford? Um, if you can't afford print, but you could get digital either for low price or for free, well, something is definitely better than nothing. And I, I absolutely applaud this. There are also questions of differential pricing policies. Um, if you look at the pattern over the last 10 years or so on uh, VAT taxes and what countries will allow you to give discounts on digital books and what won't, sometimes a digital book has been more expensive than a print book. Uh, so again, it's a complex story rather than one size fits all. One of the things that I really want to get to with this background, the framing questions are these. The first is, how much are we actually reading? It's one thing to say, well, you know, we read so much in print and we love it and it's so good for us and we concentrate. Well, let's ask how much we're actually reading in the first place. And where was a switch to digital the cause of what we'll see to be a reduction in what a number of countries are doing and how they read. I would just say that in the sources I look at, um, people in India read a whole lot more than in much of the rest of the world. Um, so what I'm saying may or may not resonate locally, but it certainly does in the United States and Europe. Okay, so that's one framing question, how much are we reading? The second, which will look more targeted, is how does digital reading differ from print and what are the consequences? Obviously, I can't talk about everything there. I've written two books so far and there's more where that comes from. Um, but I'll focus on two questions. To what extent are the differences that we find between reading in these two media, print versus digital, to what extent are they shaped by the affordances of the medium themselves? That is, 
is it because the container matters that I'm reading differently? The alternative perspective is to what extent are these differences shaped by the preconceptions, by the perceptions, by the mindset we have about how you're supposed to read on these different media. And then as a result of those two questions, the question that I want to, um, to bring us to is are digital new technologies reshaping what we think we mean when we talk about reading? Okay. My research. Um, this is just a summary of the kind of research that I've been doing over the years. You'll forget about the pilot studies behind them. Uh, the first was a study that uh, I completed essentially in 2016, got published in 2017, with university students from uh, five different countries. Uh, one of them was India because I had a wonderful research assistant, um, Mazneen Havalala, who um, was able to get some data from India. And we asked a series of questions using an online survey. And we'll get to what some of those questions are. I then had the opportunity to ask some of those same kinds of questions, but some additional ones with secondary school students. So the question was, are younger generations coming to the same conclusions in terms of their perceptions? Because remember, these are perception studies um, about differences in the way they read in reading in print versus reading digitally. Uh, the data that I collected from university students was, were collected between 2013 and 2015. So now we're getting years on. The question is, have things changed? All right, we got some data from an international school in Stavanger, which is in Norway, in spring 2019. We thought, aha, that's great. And the person who put the, really was influential there was the librarian of the school. Kim Tio Dickerson, she's the third author there. And uh, she was moving to an international school in Amsterdam. And she said, guess what folks, if you'd like, we can gather more data. We said, terrific. Uh, the pandemic came and it took us a while to recast the survey. We we're all ready to go, we got it approved. The pand pandemic came and uh, things went on hold. But then we started asking, have people's attitudes in this case, secondary school students have their attitudes towards reading in print versus reading digital shifted because of their needing to do virtual learning and a lot of digital reading thanks to the pandemic. So we were able to gather some data in spring 2021. Um, we said, let's do a follow-up. Now that people are back in face-to-face -face classes, well, they weren't totally, but they were um, significantly on and off. Uh, so we gathered some data in fall 2021. I'll be talking about various parts of these data soon. Uh, the end numbers just are the number of participants in, in each of the surveys. I'll also mention, because I'll allude to later, a study that uh, Anna Mangan, um, who's a renowned um, reading researcher, uh, especially on issues of print versus digital uh, in Norway, a uh, study that she and I did of university faculty, looking at two things. One is, how much reading are they assigning to university students? And do they perceive that the amount of their assignments have been influenced by um, the growth of digital technologies? That is, have digital technologies changed in any way the amount of reading that they're assigning, whether it's print or digital? And then I've listed two of the books um, that Bordick mentioned earlier. Okay. So Let's talk about, um, now I'm lost on my slides. Okay. Okay, so let's look at how much people are actually reading these days. And the answer is, um, sadder than one might like to believe. Uh, first statistics from uh, adults in the United States where uh, the standard survey that is used is called the American Time Use Survey run by our Department of Labor, looking at um, people 15 years and old, age 15 and older. And if you compare the number of minutes they reported reading for leisure each day in 2004, it was 23 minutes a day. Not great, but something. 2018, okay, this is pre-pandemic, 16 minutes a day. 
This does not look happy. Okay, another study looking at the amount students were reading uh, was done by uh, an organization called Common Sense Media. Um, and they asked a number of questions, including how much are you reading for leisure? The number, and this, this was of so-called tweens, that is kids between the ages of eight and 12, and then teenagers between the ages of 11 and 17. And the, question, and, and the amount that they said they were reading was uh, minimal, but what I thought was a more interesting statistic to share with you was how much they said they enjoy reading. Do they enjoy reading a lot? So the tweens, that is the about to be teenagers, 38% of them said, uh, I enjoy reading a lot. Teenagers who were sampled at the same time, probably the data from 2018, I'm guessing, 24% said I enjoy reading a lot. Okay, so the older they get, the less they say they enjoy reading. We'll see comparable statistics on this from elsewhere in a moment. Another statistic that unfortunately I understand, but saddens me greatly, um, comes from something called the National Survey of Student Engagement, which every, I believe every two years, surveys a whole range of questions about uh, university students. One of the questions they ask is how much academic reading do you do in an average week? And they asked it of, they asked this question of first year students, freshmen, and they asked it of seniors. For seniors in 2019, the reading amount for academic work, this is school work, 7.1 hours per week. And my jaw dropped when I first saw that because back in the day, even in the United States, the amount of academic reading was closer to 30 hours a week, maybe more. This is 7.1 hours. We're not reading a lot in the United States, but the United States is not alone. So uh, I have some data from uh, the Dutch Reading Foundation where uh, the ages are roughly comparable and the years are not totally comparable, but somewhat to the American data that we saw. 2013, um, teenagers, uh, we're reading 23 minutes a day. Okay, that was sort of like the American adults um, that we earlier talked about in 2004. By 2018, it was down to 14 minutes. Okay, in the United States, it was 16 minutes, but slightly different age range. The international PISA test, which is a test of 15 year olds, when you look at the administration of the test that was done in 2018, um, that's the one that has been analyzed um, and, that, and that focused on reading. One of the questions they asked, in addition to the testing of reading and math and, and so forth, was, um, do you only read when you have to? When they asked this question in 2000, 36% of the 15-year-olds said, I only read when I have to. Okay, so that meant that in principle, 64% read some other times out of choice. 2018, almost half the students, the 15 year olds said, I only read when I have to. That's a dramatic drop. I'll also mention now um, en passant that the students from the International School of Amsterdam is where 10 to 16 year olds, 32% um, of them said, I only read when I have to. But that looks good, except these are also, this is also a statistic containing younger children. And as we saw, the younger kids are reading more than the older kids. So you may say, well, you know, it's not as if people aren't getting content, they're not getting information, they're not getting entertainment. There's so many other places. There's audio, there's podcasts, there's audio books, there's video, there are all the TED Talks, there are all the other YouTubes. Yes, uh, and I won't have time to go into it unless you have questions. Um, we have some data, very little, but some, on how much you learn from audio and how much you learn from video, and the answer is not as much as when you are reading for, for the data that you have. Okay, some other kinds of questions we can ask about how much you read that aren't amount questions so much as medium and genre, as, as length issues and genre issues, and then I'll get to medium. Okay, there's some really interesting studies that have been done um, on how much reading full-length works, and particularly fiction works. 
have on reading proficiency. So proficiency here is measured as comprehension tests. Um, there's what has been called the fiction effect that shows that kids who read more fiction have higher comprehension reading scores on the regular reading proficiency tests that schools can give. There are studies that show that people who read book length works and it wasn't specified whether they're fiction or not, but for kids, these are largely fiction books that are being read. If you read book length works rather than shorter things or read comics um, or magazines, um, book length work reading correlates positively with reading proficiency. There was also an interesting um, conclusion that the PISA study came from about the effect of medium on um, proficiency. And I'll just read it to you. Students are reported reading books more often in paper than digital format, perform better in reading, that is the PISA reading tests, and spend more time reading for enjoyment, and that is self-reported. Um, interestingly, the students who did the best in the reading parts of the PISA used both reading, but used both print and digital formats rather than only one or only the other. But most of their, at least more of their reading was in print than digital. I'll also mention that when you look at what ebooks are selling, it has been the case, I can't vouch for the fact that it is in the last year or two, um, it has been the case that the bestsellers of romance and science fiction, unless you're studying um, um, foundation <laughs> uh, books, you're probably reading for pleasure rather than um, reading for learning. Okay, the data that I'll be referencing today come from this university study that I did that I referenced earlier. And as I said, the data are quotes older, but really interestingly, they're quite similar to uh, what we find uh, in more recent studies. Uh, then there are what I call the American University data. I was giving a lecture uh, to a class of freshmen and sophomores. And I said, well, before I give the lecture, I'm gonna give you a version of the survey that I've given to university students in large numbers uh, across nationally, and that I've given uh, with my colleagues to, um, to secondary school students. Uh, so there are only 35 students from whom I got those data. And then I gave a lecture to uh, my departmental faculty. And I said, what the heck, I'll ask you some of the same questions. And there happened to be 35 of them as well. Then there are the students from the International School of Stavanger from spring 2019, and the two samples from the International School of Amsterdam. So I've just put those labels there. You don't have to remember which is ISA and ISS. It's just for me um, to have a, um, an answer. A little bit on how we asked questions. Um, many of the questions were Likert scale questions. So um, uh, in one case, there were four points on the Likert scale. Uh, for the studies that we did with the secondary school students, we shifted to five point scales, which made it a little difficult to compare data, but the trends are identical. So I'm less worried about that as a methodologist. Uh, and then we asked um, some open-ended questions. And there were four of them that were most critical. Uh, the first is, what is the one thing you like most about reading in print? What is the one thing you like most about reading digitally? Second question. Then we ask the same questions about like and least. What do you like least about reading in print? What do you like least about reading digitally? And we've learned an incredible amount from asking the first questions, some of which I will share. All right, what do we know about the media themselves? What do you know about their affordances? So their affordances are the things um, you know, it's a term that's been used in psychology, originated by psychologist named Gibson years ago, but it's one that's been used in um, digital media research to ask how much are the things that something is good for, you know, so a desk is good for holding my computer, um, a computer is good for doing online searches, um, what are the affordances, what are the things that you can do with um, a particular device. And I'll just focus on uh, a couple of things here, and the data are from the secondary school students. And these were all things that were, these are all comments that the students made in response to the question of what is the one thing you like most about reading in print? A huge number of them talked about haptics, that is touch. So one of them said, for example, I can feel the paper in my hand and just the touch and 
feel of it makes me focus more. And we are just starting counting up these open-ended responses, um, but for the most recent data that we collected, sorry, for the spring 2021 data that we collected, 29% of all the responses to what's the one thing you like most about reading in print had something to do with touch. Clearly that's not um, content, that is container. Okay, then site issues. It's easy to see how much progress you've made. Now, a number of us talk anecdotally about, oh, I can see where I put my bookmark and how much of the book I have to go and how much I've already completed. If you are a secondary school student, that notion of progress of having gotten somewhere of look how much I've managed to read is incredibly important. And we just can't do the numbers on that, but it's far, far more frequent than it is for adults. Then there's the issue of smell. I was astounded beginning with the study that I did with this five country cross national data collection, the number of people who talked about smell being what they liked most about reading in print. And I thought, oh, it's just adults who do that, older adults. Uh, so one of the students, um, the secondary school student said, the smell of the book stimulates something in my brain to concentrate. There's a lot of discussion these days, uh, at least in some quarters, and they're doing the right thing, uh, on what's called embodied reading. That is how much the rest of your body, not just your mind, is involved in the process of reading. It's what you smell, it's what you touch, it's, um, it's how you position your body when you read and so forth. Is it cozy to read? I had lots of people from the secondary school students saying, reading print is cozy. Well, that's not, your mind gets cozy when your body gets cozy. Okay, affordances of digital. So these are some responses to um, what did you like most about reading uh, digitally? Well, not surprisingly, there's a lot of discussion of functionality. You can adjust the font. Um, you can have internet access, you can search, you can get information online because a lot of the students were non-native speakers of English and the secondary school students were schools were run in English. Uh, the dictionary access was incredibly important to them. They talked about portability and storage, all things we would expect. What I didn't expect is some of these perceived advantages of digital. So I put it in red so we don't miss it. I love that you don't see how many pages the book has. All right, what they're saying, again, it's students. So if you wanna ask what, does, what kind of impact does medium have on students, particularly in this case, secondary school students, uh, a number of the students talked about, I don't like reading print because I see how many pages there are. This looks overwhelming, this looks too hard. But if you don't, you know, if you don't see how much there is to go, it doesn't look that overwhelming. And then there was this other comment that was quite precious. You don't think you're really reading, but you are. Gee, mom, I'm reading. Isn't that great? Even though it doesn't feel like it, well, maybe you're not actually putting your mind in it. And that's why you're not actually reading in any serious uh, way that has um, long-term learning effects. Okay. Let me talk briefly, if I might, about uh, the comprehension studies that have been done. And this is you know, what we know about reading the different media. Uh, the phrase I like to use is God is in the details. Doesn't matter what your religion is. If you look at the early studies that were done, beginning around the turn of the millennium, uh, although more frequently, say 2006, seven, eight, nine, um, there were studies being done that were essentially showing that reading in print versus reading digitally, and there's been studies with some university students and some adults out in the work world as well, didn't seem to make any difference. Same comprehension levels. And then you look at the later studies, and in many cases, and I'll get to some of the qualifiers in a second, in many cases, print seemed to show superior comprehension results. What was going on? There are several meta-analyses that have been done. The, um, probably the most rigorous um, was done by Pablo Delgado and his colleagues in Spain. Um, and by the way, at the end of this PowerPoint, I have all the references, so you can look up later if, you, if you're interested. And what they found was a number of instances in which 
um, print reading really was demonstrably, you know, by psychological testing standards, superior to uh, reading digitally. Well, what is this goddess in the details business? The differences started showing up with longer texts and their criterion in the Delgado and all this study was 500 words or more. Unfortunately, most of the reading studies are with short texts. So it's really hard to look at a comprehension of um, a, a full novel, for example, um, or a full play in reading in one medium versus another. Genre seems to make a difference. Most of the studies that are been, have definitively shown um, superior comprehension performance with print but then an informational text, not narrative. And not surprisingly, because getting people to read 200 pages or even 100 pages, even 50 pages, and then doing a study is really tough um, in, in terms of methodology. Another study showed that the kinds of questions that you ask, the kind of comprehension questions you ask, made a difference for whether print versus digital comprehension results were different. For concrete questions, where you could pick the answer out of the text itself, what I call pebbles on the beach <laughs> answers, um, there didn't seem to be much difference in comprehension between print versus digital. However, if you asked an abstract question that required your study participant to make inferences, there was better performance with print. Another series of studies asked specifically about uh, what they call key points versus I'll call them details, protected and easier to understand the nature and they use, you know, the, ma the main points, the main bullet points, as opposed to the details. Com comparable results, roughly this was with university students. Um, if you're looking at comprehension um, of the key points, but when you look at the details, even if they were pebbles on the beach, buried there, but findable, um, people did less well. And then one of my favorite stories was done by my colleague Anna Mangan and some of her colleagues, um, in reading a real short story. So she fabricated a book <laughs> that had a short story in it. Um, it took about an hour or so to read and um, had people, one set of people read digitally, one set of people read the book in print. And when she asked basic questions, basic comprehension questions, the results were roughly comparable for the two media. However, when she asked where in the story a particular event appeared. And we're physically in the book, that is in the linear span, did the event occur? People did better in print, which probably has to do with the, uh, with the haptic nature of a physical book. You know about where it was, you know about where on the page it was, if you have a good memory. Okay. Getting to the question of calibration, which I mentioned earlier. Um, one of the questions is, do you think, now we're getting to mindset, <laughs> do you think you will do better or you did do better in a comprehension test reading digitally versus in print? And some studies have been done with lower school kids. Some studies have been done with university kids, students. And in both cases, the students, and this is, these are fairly recent, um, in both cases, the students said, I'm going to do better digitally. And in both cases, they actually did better in print. I'll mention that in the earlier studies, you know, the ones around 2010, 2011, 12, 13, when you ask people, because some studies did, do you think you did better in print or digitally? People were reporting, I did better in print. So what I think has changed is the amount of digital reading you do, the amount that schools are saying, digital reading is great, you're gonna learn just as much, or I'm not even gonna ask about learning, I'll assume you'll learn just as much. Students are believing that they're learning just as much. And by the way, print tends to take longer to read, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so I assume I'm gonna do better in digitally because I can just zip right along. I'll mention that the one study that has done a really good job of comparing print with audio, the same material, and there have been some others, but this is probably the clean, cleanest study, um, showed uh, you, know, you had a, um, a podcast of a lecture and then you had the lecture written out in print. 
you um, ask people how well do you think you're going to do on the test you ask them how well did you do and before i tell you and uh, the people perceive they would do better on the podcast they did better in print so it's the same kind of issue we're talking about all right, let me mention multitasking. And I'm going to show you the same slide again. So if you miss any of it, you'll have another shot at it. What do we know about how people use the two media? One of the things we know is they do a heck of a lot of multitasking. And um, the first set of data uh, that have the green bullets on them um, all ask the question the same way on a five point Likert scale. Um, asking, um, do, you, do you multitask uh, very often, pretty often, somewhat, not very much, not at all, and so forth. And what I've coalesced here is the first two categories of very often, pretty often. And what you see is an incredible uh, um, divergence in how much, again, it's self-reported, how much people reported multitasking when they're reading in print versus multitasking when they're reading digitally. Um, the ISA are uh, uh, secondary school students. They did not have seniors, so the average age was probably around 12 or 13. Um, they said they didn't do much multitasking with print, but lots more with screen. Uh, for the American University students and my university faculty in my department, they basically said, oh, I don't multitask when I'm reading in print. And I got a little red asterisk there. I I'm not sure that's true. But be it, as it, be it as it may, what matters most is the divergence between how much they perceive they multitask with print and how much they perceive self-report they multitask with screens. I mean, the numbers scream out at you. For the earlier studies I did, which was a four-point Likert scale, and it, for university, it coalesces five different countries. Um, People said they were doing a lot more multitasking when they're reading in print. 41% of those two 429 people said, um, yeah, I, I do a fair amount of multitasking in print, but they did far more with digital screens. Uh, and the same um, unequal numbers are showing up for the students we saw in 2019 in secondary school uh, in Stavanger. All right, so let's start getting to um, mindset. What do we know about mindset issues? There was a term created in 1984, probably it was prescient, <laughs> um, called AIM, which stood for Amount of Invested Mental Effort. And it was developed by a psychologist named Gabriel um, um, uh, Solomon. He wanted to know, this was back in the age where people watch TV, <laughs> we weren't talking about digital reading on screens. Um, he wanted to know whether if you saw a video image of information, students, and these were sixth graders, so they were sort of around 11, 12 years of age. He wanted to know whether they comprehended more if they were reading in print or if they were seeing the same material on a television screen. And it was a calibration study as well as a comprehension study because he asked them, do you think it takes more work? Do you think you invest more effort if you're reading in one or the other? Overall, they said, uh, takes less work to see the television version and I'm gonna do better on it. Well, it probably took less work because they put less effort into it, um, but they did better in print. <laughs> so it's the same kind of story um, of calibration that we saw earlier, although in some ways this is the uh, beginning of our asking this kind of question about alternative media. Uh, a study was done by, um, by Ackerman and Lauterman in 2012 in Israel with university students, in this case, comparing comprehension with print versus digital. And it wasn't a calibration study per se, but what they asked was, what they looked at um, in one of the testing conditions was how much time uh, the students spent reading the digital text versus how much time they spent reading the print text and then what their comprehension scores were. In that study, the students spent less time with the digital and did better in the comprehension on the print. 
So again, it's that same kind of story that basically is revealing that we presuppose, or the students in these studies at least, presupposed you didn't have to put as much effort in and you just do just fine, but in actual fact, they turned out to be wrong. There's some other theories floating around these days about um, mindset. Uh, one is called the shallowing hypothesis that essentially says, when we're reading digitally, we have a, a mindset that says, you don't have to read very carefully. And another way of phrasing that is to say, we have a social media state of mind. Think about how much time you spend looking at people's status updates on Facebook or how much time you spend um, reading a, a, a blog post where you just want to see if you got mentioned or whatever it happens to be. And you don't really want to, you're not really feeling it's worth your time and effort to read the whole thing. Uh, and in a number of the studies comparing print versus digital, um, the authors, for example, in the Delgado et alia um, meta-analysis, they invoke the shallowing hypothesis as a way of explaining why uh, readers are doing better reading in print than reading digitally, uh, because reading digitally, they have this shallowing mindset as to how much effort you have to put forth. Um, more on mindset, and these are the statistics that initially blew my mind when I started looking at them. These are data on concentration, where I had asked a question, and it wasn't a like at scale question. Uh, it was a question for the university student, first for the university students that I studied, gathered data from 2013 to 15. Um, when I lined up all the different media you could read on, so there was there was print, uh, there were ebooks, there were tablets, there were phones, um, reading on a computer screen, and so forth. What is the medium is easiest for you to concentrate or focus on? Ninety-two percent of those 429 students, university students, said it's easiest for me to concentrate in print. When we asked the same question um, of secondary school students in spring 2019, 85% said it's easiest to concentrate in reading in print. Uh, so what you'll find is there are a number of ways of asking, of getting at the same issue of mindset, asking about concentration, asking about um, amount that you multitask and so forth. And what's really clear is if you bother to ask, and I do say bother to ask students themselves, rather than just assume as a, as a faculty member, as an administrator, uh, that container doesn't matter. It's all the same stuff. It's content, right? If you bother to ask the students, they have a very different take on things. All right, so this is the, these are the data from the more recent way of asking the question. Um, the question was, how easy it is for you, how easy is it for you to concentrate when you're reading in print? How easy is it for you to concentrate when reading digitally? So these are the data from fall 2021 from secondary school students. Plus I threw in those 35 American university students. This is from fall 21 and the 35 American university faculty from fall 21. And what do you see? Astounding similarity of people telling you it's easier to concentrate when I read in print. Those ratios are either two to one, almost three to one. I concentrate best when reading in print. And that's a perception of how you are putting your mind. That's not something the medium is making you do. Yes, there are affordances that help, but the medium itself is not all there is to the story. Okay, so is multitasking a major factor? I told you to go back to this multitasking screen. There it is amount that you're multitasking when you're reading on a digital screen versus reading in print, huge amounts of multitasking that probably are taking your mind away, making it not so easy to concentrate as if in principle, you're not multitasking when you're reading in print. When I collected the original data 2013 to 2015, Asked, what do you like most? What do you like least about reading in print? Those open ended questions at the end of the survey. I was startled to see some of the following kinds of comments. What do you like least about reading in print? Just boring material and hard to read. Or it takes time to sit down and focus on the material. 
okay, that doesn't sound so promising. Uh, and this from one of the students at the International School of Stavanger um, from 2019 spring. Print can tire you out really fast and get boring, no matter how interesting the book is. In contrast, in asking what do you like most about reading digitally, again, for the university students and for the International School of Stavanger, um, secondary school students, a couple of people said, what I like most about reading digitally is it's entertaining. It's fun. Well, if you could have entertainment or fun as opposed to having something boring, how would you vote with your feet? Because of seeing these comments about print being boring, my colleagues and I decided that when we looked at the students at the second, the secondary school students at the International School of Stavanger, the International School of Amsterdam, spring 2021, fall 2021, we'd specifically ask a question using a Likert scale about whether reading in print or reading digitally was boring. So the question was, reading with print is boring, reading with a digital screen is boring, and you could say uh, very much or uh, not at all. Remember this is during the height of the pen or, or the continuation of the pandemic where overwhelmingly materials are still being read digitally and everything else you're doing, it's your math homework, it's your physics homework, it's, uh, it, it's, it's your art, it, it's everything is being done on a digital screen. So it's a little hard to separate out digital screen reading of the kind of say you using an ebook versus digital screen everything else. And we asked about digital screen everything else, but it's not clear that it's fair to ask kids to make these distinctions. In any event, what came out was the number of students who said reading on a digital screen was boring was huge compared with this number of students who said reading in print was boring. Okay. I don't know if normalcy ever comes back again. And if return to print happens, at least to whatever percent it was before the pandemic, I don't know if we'll see a shift in these perceptions again. We'll have to wait a couple of years to find out. But when I asked this question of those 35 students at American University, freshmen and sophomores, again, asked just a couple of months ago, is reading in print, you know, reading in print or reading with digital screen is boring? The far larger number of people said reading in print was boring and they didn't, you know, it was boring on digital screens, but it was worse with print. And I suspect this has to do with the fact that university students, particularly in the United States, have been doing digital reading for academic purposes for a long time. Uh, high schools in the United States uh, very, very heavily use digital books long before the pandemic. Um, and that only heightened. Um, middle school students, even lower school students are using digital books. So I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that in the international students that schools, they had been using print and now suddenly they were thrown into the overwhelming amount of digital. So again, uh, some of these findings have to be All right. Let's think again about mindset, but mindset and effort involved. So here are some comments from students about what they liked least about reading print. One said, what I like least about reading in print, I have to put 110% of my concentration into reading the words, suggesting that when reading digitally, you don't have to put all your concentration in. You have to concentrate more. And is that because of the perception you're supposed to concentrate when reading print? And a, a shallowing hypothesis that you're not needing to concentrate when reading digitally? Again, it's a mindset issue. Uh, this is what one of the students in my earlier university study said. Takes me, what I le like least about reading in print, it takes me longer because I read more carefully or digital looks shorter to read on. Okay, and then there were the questions of authenticity. What do I like most about reading in print? It feels more real as if you're actually reading a book. It's real reading. You get lost in the story. It feels more calm. You're able to lose yourself in the words and you can read forever without thinking about anything else. Okay, that's a mindset issue. What do you like least about reading digitally? Distraction. Okay, so we're still tallying up how many people say what I like least about reading um, digitally is that it's distracting, it's hard to concentrate. Um, 
Other people, some, some lovely comments, it's harder to see what's happening in my mind because there's light shining in my face through the screen. I wanna see what's in my mind. It isn't as immersive, I can't imagine a lot. Okay, so we've seen what the current trends are and the notion of what it means to read. There's a decline in pleasure reading. Um, there's more and more use of digital technologies. Uh, the educational focus has moved overwhelmingly um, to digital. And um, we don't have much awareness, particularly in the United States, but I suspect elsewhere as well in the educational space as to whether the medium actually matters. Another trend that's happening in terms of reshaping reading is we're assigning shorter and shorter readings. And the study that I did with Anna Mangan indicated that digital technologies were contributing to that because they weren't doing the reading anyway. Maybe if I give them, give them something short, they'll read it. Um, and there's also an emphasis in the United States in particular, but it's also in Western Europe um, that I can speak for in lower schools with a growing emphasis on using multiple, on learning how to use multiple sources online rather than reading single linear texts. And in higher education in the United States, there are fewer and fewer students who are studying such subjects as literature and history, which traditionally have been reading intensive. Okay. Are these technologies reshaping our notion of what it means to read? Will we still maintain that reading in print at least requires concentration and takes more time? Or as we're reading more digitally, will we start taking that same mindset and applying it to print? And as one of my students reminds me, I can multitask when I'm reading um, with print. I just have my phone next to me. Some final thoughts. Digital reading is not going away. It's too convenient. And publishers who have a lot of control, particularly in education, are pushing digital textbooks. Um, medium affordances are real, although different people place different values on them. For now, judging from the secondary school data, we still have the perception that reading in print takes more effort but it's not clear that we will in the future. So some other final thoughts, I think, uh, and this is where, this is why I wrote my book, How We Read Now, because I want to try to reshape the kinds of policies that we have in schools once they can stop thinking about the pandemic and start thinking about the curriculum. Uh, that is the things we can do, and I've enumerated some of them, um, of trying to build a culture um, in which reading is important, to model that kind of reading that we think is important, I think people can be educated as schools administrators. They're, they're not ready yet. They have other things on their mind. But at the same time, I know we have to work out pedagogies for mindful digital reading um, because digital is not going away. So I'm going to close with one final uh, comment from a student. This was in some open-ended comments she added. This is from the International School of Amsterdam. If I read on a digital screen, I tend to not accidentally pull all-nighters. With paper books, I do. Here are the references, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, this was a fascinating set of data coupled with uh, very interesting insights into our reading practices now. Uh, before we start the QA, this is for the um, audience, if you have any questions for Professor Barron, please type it in either the Q&A box or the chat box. I'll read those questions out and she'll respond to your questions. We already have, I think, two, three questions in those box, but uh, using or abusing my position as the chair, I'll start with two questions. You know, these are very fascinating set of uh, 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 arguments. I was also mm -hmm. thinking about the possibility of uh, you know, the change in the very idea of reading itself. You know, right. it's not simply whether you read in print or digitally, but what reading itself means may also differ because of the introduction of the digital media. What I have in mind comes from disciplines like, let's say, uh, digital humanities, where you have this large data set and right. you read them, right? <laughs> This is a very different way of reading, but it is only possible because of the digital moment. So if you have any thoughts on this, this different notions of reading, 
that, mm-hmm. that the digital moment has introduced in our lives, not only in terms of research, which obviously mm-hmm. digital humanities does, but yeah. other forms of reading, whether we can rethink the very idea of reading itself, not just across media, but yes. in, in itself. That is one idea, a uh, question I have. And second, very quickly, I'll ask one more. Yes. You know, you very briefly mentioned social media mentality. Mm-hmm. If you could elaborate a little more, because social media is part of, uh, I mean, so much part of our lives, uh, our mm-hmm. contemporary lives, and we read so much on social media at mm-hmm. the same time. It is, it is, even the students you, you interviewed, for instance, they'll be on social media for a substantial amount of their days, right? Right. And, and it's not only Facebook or Twitter. Facebook and Twitter are becoming like you know older uh, forms of social media Every <laughs> right. day there is something or the other you right. always interact with with other people through uh, text through visuals through videos how does social media impact the very notion of reading so we can start with these two and then we can collect a few more questions and okay you can respond. You've, give, you've given me much to think about and if you don't mind i'll start backwards absolutely <laughs> some notes. Um, And I'll first start with um, some research that was done on how much time we spend reading in uh, reading a newspaper that's digital versus reading a newspaper that's print. And the answer is just in terms of number of minutes, we spend far, far less time reading digital news. We meaning large sample of people, not individuals. we spend far less time speed reading a digital newspaper than we do reading a, a print newspaper. Which brings me, again, going backwards in your question, to what I now think I'm going to call a Snapchat model of reading. Okay. <laughs> Namely, you see it and then it's gone. Because one of the things that I think happens with social media is you read something and then it's gone, as opposed to the kind of reading we used to think about of old in print, where you could come back to it again and think about it again. I mean, there's some people who save their texting streams and there are others who just clear out their phone (laughs) because it's taking up space in the cloud. Um, So I think part of this mentality issue has less to do, that I'm interested in, has less to do whether it's social media, whether it's reading something digitally as a newspaper, than it does with the mindset that says, I look at it and it's done. I don't have to come back to it again. I don't have to revisit it again. In a number of the pilot studies I did earlier on, as well as I think with my university students, I asked, are you more likely to reread something if it's in print or if it's digital? And it was really clear, they're much more likely to reread if it's in print. So there's this notion of print is worth going back to. Now going to the question of whether we're redefining reading, I mentioned earlier on en passant that in the United States, it's become extremely common for university students to rent rather than purchase books. And as a result of that, and whether it's digital books or print books, if you rent a print book and you want to highlight it, and then you send it back to Amazon or one of the other vendors that that rents books, they won't give you all your money back because you had to give them their credit card (laughs) because now you've damaged the book, right? All right, so therefore you don't highlight, you don't underline. And it's not that that's a great way of learning. You know, we know from a lot of psychological studies, there are far better ways to learn than to highlight, but it's something. And if you're not even doing that, and if you're not taking notes somewhere else, how much are you learning? If you only have the book for the semester, and that's what this inclusive access model does, you only have the book for the semester for the term that you're using it, then it's gone. And if you have a a growing mindset that something is gone when you've looked at it once, then that's not what reading has been about. If you go back to to Eric Havelock's work done in 
I think the original book of Enter Plato was probably, I don't know, 1959, 1960, something like that, where he argued that Greek philosophy was able to emerge because of the way writing was being used by the pre-Socratics. That you'd have to look at what you wrote, that you could rework what it was, you could rethink what it was. Um, now, Havelock said this had something to do with the emergence of the Greek alphabet as opposed to Phoenician continental alphabet. We could debate that, put that aside. The issue was, does writing enable us to think, to reflect, to come back again, to redo? And if you have a mindset, a Snapchat mindset that says, no, you don't need to do that, then we're changing dramatically what reading is about. One of the examples I like to give um, from my own experience is what happens when we access a library book, when we researchers access a library book digitally. When I go to a library and I pick a book off a shelf, even if I'm looking for one thing, I, um, I tend to look at other things too. If I'm looking for one article, but then I see, oh, there's a collection of other articles. This was actually more interesting or more useful than the thing I thought I was originally going to find. Uh, and this goes to the, one of the questions asked about um, keyword search. Um, we look for something and then we, what I call use rather than read a lot of books. And if you're using in the sense of you do that keyword search and, and I do it with everyone else because it's too much of a pain in the neck if a book is divided into chapters. I have to click on each chapter separately. I can't just with my hands move the book. So that, that engenders a different kind of reading and engenders a kind of reading that is far less thoughtful. Coming to the question of digital humanities, let us not forget there were microfilms, there were microforms um, before there were um, all kinds of library archives put online. So it's not as if we didn't have um, reproductions of text previously. It was a pain in the neck to use them, but you could, you could use them. Um, digital humanities means many things to many people. One of the things it means is being able to access archives. And to the extent you can get archives that otherwise you could not get access to, I don't care what format it's on, you can largely, okay, for many archives, you can print it out. And one of the things we know about a lot of researchers is you look at it online, you decide how much you want, and then you print it out. And then you are back to print, thank you. <laughs> Um, or people who are doing this kind of serious research have been using those microfilms and microforms earlier. So it's not that big a deal to now see it in, in a cleaner format um, that you can access at home or from your office. Uh, there's a question, shall I just take it on reading as a uh, solitary practice? Uh, should I just read it out? Or uh, yes, please. Others, or I'll, I'll read it, I brought it up. Uh, histories of novels, Earlier talked about reading as a solitary practice, a mode of withdrawal from the world, are there thoughts on the solitarity, uh, sociality of digital reading? Yes. Uh, yes. So there have been a number of people, including a wonderful book, um, sort of a short book uh, by Marcel Proust called On Reading, in which he argues that it's really important to think for yourself what you think about what you're reading before listening to what other people have to say. Because reading is a way of using your mind, not just of having social discussion. Okay. Then various kinds of digital reading in social space developed. Probably one of the best known, at least in the United States, is Goodreads, where you can um, say, you know, I read this and here's what I thought about it. And in some ways, it's a kind of version of a freshman college, not very sophisticated uh, discussion in a beginning literature class <laughs> where you wanna encourage people to talk and uh, whether they have something profound to say is less important than you got them to feel empowered that they could say something. Um, I have no objection to people reading socially because in some ways, you know, book clubs, which became incredibly um, popular in the United States beginning over a century ago, uh, particularly among women, but not solely so, um, became ways of talking about what you were reading. Um, 
But the question is, did you read it first yourself? Did you think about it first yourself? Do you have your opinion as opposed to what you think um, the um, alpha male or female in the class or in the, um, in the book club is likely to be thinking and you say, yes, that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly what I think. Reading is supposed to be an opportunity. And this is, this is why novels developed in the first place for you to try to understand the social condition. And to do that, you've got to read carefully. You've got to go back again. I mean, there are the whole sets of discussions about whether it's possible to read or it's only possible to reread. And these days, very, very few people reread, which changes the nature of what reading can accomplish for us. Naomi, I'll just uh, read out a few questions that we have in the Q&A box. Sure. And you can respond to them. The first one is not actually about your talk, but about the Chinese calligraphy behind you. Curious to know what the Chinese <laughs> calligraphy behind Professor Barron says. <laughs> you may or may not respond to it. I'd but, be happy to, because okay. I, am, I, I, am, I am very um, delighted to have it. This is a scroll that was made for me and my husband and my son by, a, um, um, by uh, the, the, the father of a colleague of mine in, um, in, in China who uh, in Japan, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I, I keep reading Chinese calligraphy. It, 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 okay, so the Chinese kanji come from, the, the, the Japanese kanji come from the Chinese characters, absolutely true. <laughs> um, and anyway, this was a, um, a, a banner and, I, and I'm going to forget which of the um, Japanese generals it was around 1600. Um, it was a war banner of basically his clans, and I'll have to look up exactly which one it is. Um, that's not right. Uh, motto for, for fighting and, and who they were. So that's what it is. Okay. Okay, sorry no, about that. Too, not at all. Definitely, not definitely at Japanese, all. definitely Japanese. <laughs> we have two very uh, interesting questions. The first one is from Dr. Ranu Toma. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, could you please contextualize significance of print media? in digital culture prevailing in media world over. The question of media, I think, is, is quite central to her concern that how print digital divide, not only about our reading practices, but the way we access media. You partly mentioned this in, in, in your first response about uh, you know, social media, but if you can uh, address it once uh, in, in, in more detailed terms, there is one more which is from my uh, colleague, Avadhendra. Okay. Could, could I answer this first one? Yeah, please, please. Okay, go if, if you don't mind. No, no, uh, not if, about, I, please. If, if I understand it correctly, and please, um, uh, Dr. Tomar, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, to put it a little more um, simplistically, d does print media have a snowball's chance in hell <laughs> in a world of digital culture? Yes, I think that is one major concern. <laughs> Okay, and uh, the answer is, in principle, yes, and definitely in some societies. So in principle, yes, just judging from the changeover in statistics in the United States from the Association of American Publishers, that people are going back to buying print, and the print sales are up, and the digital sales are down again. Okay, people didn't have to do that because these days everything is available digitally that's available in print as a book. There's no question about it. But people are choosing what they would like and it's not all digital. A second issue is I think the pandemic has helped us get um, tired of digital reading. And the students uh, from the secondary schools have shown that to us. And third, there are cultures that really have prized reading and print reading in particular. And I suspect India is on that list. And I, um, and I suspect that um, countries such as Italy and Germany and France are on that list as well. And, you know, trends come and go. It's really interesting. Nobody thought digital books would become incredibly popular. Uh, and then 
you know, as I showed from the earlier statistics, we went back again to wanting a lot of print, even pre-pandemic. So I think it's I think it's changeable. All right, the last question, you mentioned publishers as encouraging digital reading and it comments on how the political class looks at a digital classroom university as being a cheaper option compared to building brick and mortar classrooms. It certainly seems to be a policy choice being thought of in India. Okay, I mean, this is a tough one because, uh, let me speak for the United States and then acknowledge what's happening, not just in India, but in many parts of the world. In the United States, costs are real issues. There were real issues before the pandemic came. I mean, it was said for community colleges in the United States, which are two-year schools, that um, it was more expensive to buy your books than it was to pay for tuition. And as a result, people didn't buy their books. Many people for years haven't bought their, their, their textbooks because they were too expensive. So we have to do something, but there are other kinds of something that could be done that the that the textbook publishers are not undertaking. So I would very much like to see less expensive print textbooks. You don't have to have all these glossy pictures. You don't have to have lots of expensive bindings. There are ways to do books that are far less expensive and, um, and are in print. We could do it. Um, we don't. Uh, so that's a problem. And. Um, here I'm talking about classrooms that have brick and mortar, as opposed to everything being done virtually. But even if you have um, online classes, there's no reason you can't have print books. I mean, it's true that most online classes have used online books, but there's no necessity for that. Okay, then there's the issue of the rest of the world, and I understand the money issue. I, I, I get it. Um, and digital materials have been used in a lot of the world as a way of getting something in people's hands. However, um, I, I mean, I've seen, I, my husband's from India. I, I, we have a bunch of books that were printed years ago in India. I know paper doesn't have to be expensive to still have print on it. <laughs> and I mean, you know, newsprint exists. And the things you could do if you felt there was a reason to do it, that does not have to be for everything, but it can be for some things. Print does not have to be as expensive as it is. And I think that could be one solution, whether the classes themselves are digital or face-to-face. -face. Maybe there is a uh, colleague of mine, Ravi Kant, he wants to ask you a question. Ravi Kant, would you like to switch on your video? Yeah, Ravi yeah, Kant, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Professor Braden, for. Uh, wonderful presentation. I've known you, your work since alphabet to email. Uh, <laughs> those early days of the encounter between the real and the virtual. If there can be any real, as far as, far as reading is concerned. Yeah. So wonderful. And I'm, I'm a bit overwhelmed by the, you know, the, the, the data. Uh, yeah. Data that informs your uh, reading. And mm -hmm. it, it shows a lifetime of, you know, work engagement. But I have a slightly different question, and it goes back to what Badik asked in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have, you know, the kind of surveys that you have as far as reading is concerned. We have election surveys, plenty of that, but we, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have reading surveys, right? Yeah. So uh, the question that I have, uh, however, is about this, uh, you know, the, the ecology which has completely changed uh, the, the, the culture of distraction that we have been talking about, why we feel more distracted while mm -hmm. using a digital media, but it's also about this hyperlinked existence that mm -hmm. we have, but that hyperlink is not just, uh, you know, it also redefines reading uh, for us, just as it redefines the way we receive anything in the mm -hmm. sense that uh, earlier, I mean, we are a culture which is still a lot of it is preliterate, right? So mm -hmm. we understand this, uh, this, this, uh, this notion of how uh, people lived without reading and being read to. Actually, they enjoyed being read to, and that is what they had. They had the option. So right. we are uh, returning, right? We are returning with the advance of technology, so to speak to an mm -hmm. age where we had a different relationship with language and languages. Mm -hmm. Modernity and print actually killed whole lot of languages uh, or called them dialects, reduced them to <laughs> being dialects. This is a season of their comeback, right? There's a diversity. So the distraction is also in terms of diversity. 
So this digital humanities experience is about archives, great comment, but also about an archive which is eternally expanding. And it is oral, it's visual, it's everything together, not just words. So, you know, that is also a source both of uh, distraction as well as fun and a challenge <laughs> for us to understand how do we understand reading. Uh, that's where I'll stop. It's a, it's, a, it's a comment, but yeah, it's a wonderful time once again to revisit the idea of reading. Thank you. And thank you for your comment. Um, I, I liked your characterization very much of something being both a source of enjoyment and the source of distraction. When, um, bear with me for a second. When um, printers that you could attach to your own computer and print out your own things first became available, we tended to go crazy with the kinds of fonts we would use and the sizes we would use. Uh, the description that was given in an article in the New York Times back then was our, our documents were looking like ransom notes. <laughs> we had cut out letters from newspapers of different sizes and whatever, different colors. And it took us a while to settle down to figure out what would be a reasonable way to use these new printing devices that we had in our homes or our offices to make, you know, to learn how to use them properly. Just as when word processing first came in, we had no idea how to create a good document. We'd cut and paste and stick stuff in, and then you'd, you'd print it on a dot matrix printer, and you'd tear off the, the, the paper on the side, and it looked so beautiful, except it was junk, right? Okay, so I think there's a similar place we are right now in communication history. Um, namely, we have these things we can do uh, in different media. We can, you know, have lots of books um, that are audiobooks. Well, figuring out which makes most sense to have as an audiobook. A really good narrator on a piece of fiction is probably, in some ways, more compelling and engrossing than reading it yourself for most readers who skim, because you can't skim if you have an audiobook. <laughs> okay. Um, we know that mixing modalities can be useful. So um, particularly if you have learning disabilities, if you're learning a second language, um, there are all kinds of really good projects. Or if you have um, um, uh, limited eyesight, but still some, uh, being able to hear a text at the same time you're reading it can be incredibly useful. Or I have, I, I have a, a master's student who told me when I'm reading a book, and I, I tend to get bogged down, I put on the audio, you know, like, like a pace rabbit in, 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 a, in, in a race <laughs> um, um, of greyhounds to keep me going. So there are many different things you can do, but we're trying to figure out what the best uses of which medium for which purpose might be. And it's gonna take us a while to settle down. We'll have individual choices and we'll have individual successes. We'll also have lots of individual failures of people believing, oh, I can just um, uh, read Immanuel Kant by listening when I'm on the treadmill. Well, I don't recommend it, but a lot of people think, why not? Okay, and we're gonna learn the hard way. And I hope eventually we come out the stronger. Sorry, can I can I ask a uh, yeah yeah go ahead, go ahead. A very pointed question? Are we getting into a linguistically diverse world from here on, as against the print world uh, or the world inaugurated by print, which led to uh, you know standardization, modernization, and kind of uh, diminution of uh, you know these uh, uh, languages into dialects? Okay, and, you're and not just... taking. One, one okay. related question, let me just ask okay. you. Okay. You, what you were saying from this, is it your uh, argument that the future of reading would be necessarily intermedial? I'm thinking. <laughs> I think that goes back to the earlier question of who makes what decisions? Because 
there are a lot of us who still, although we read online all day long, want to read just in print for relaxation. It's a choice. So is that intermedial? Well, it's different times of the day and different functions that I'm using different mo modalities for. Um, if I go to this question um, of, mod uh, of diversity, um, that brings me to the book that I'm working on right now, which is um, translation software is going to radically change our notion of how many languages we can function in. Mm. And it's going to radically change the possibilities for dialects continuing to flourish. Because once you have the software and you know, it, it's not all there on Google Translate now, um, it's not all there in Microsoft Word's wonderful translation tool, um, but it's getting there. And uh, now there are a lot of people who are, you know, now it's this linguist in me who's speaking. There are a lot of people who are very interested in taking um, less common languages and dialects that want to be called languages, not called dialects, thank you, um, who are trying to, to work on the software, making it possible to get uh, translation done automatically. And if I can be talking face to face with you and have, uh, and I can be speaking English and you can be speaking Bengali, but I'm only hearing the English translation and let's assume for the moment you don't know English, which obviously you do, um, then we can function quite well. I mean, I can take my, my iPhone now, I can go to Iceland and I bring up Google Translate and I can read the Icelandic menu. And soon I'll be able to do that in who knows how many dialects. Mm. You know, so if there are who knows, 2,000, 3,000 languages and let's add another 5,000 dialects, there's no reason the technology can't get us there. So in that way, we can in principle have more diversity. Is that what's gonna happen? I don't think so. I think there will still be certain languages that have standards, which for educational and maybe you can call them political social, uh, socio-political reasons are, are going to be seen as the standard just as in Germany, there are many dialects, but as Hochdeutsch, you've got to know if you want to, um, to advance um, in society. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have answered all these questions. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Nomi. It was a really interesting talk. You know, the, the data set that you discussed, the insights that you uh, offered, it was a very interesting and, and, and we'll need some more time to, to process the whole thing. I think. <laughs> it was a very new experience for many of us, I'm sure from for many of, in our audience as well, to engage with this kind of very interesting and long kind of you know, research on, on the very practice of reading or the very idea of reading. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ella. Thank you. For, thank you for the opportunity. I very much enjoyed the questions and just the chance to share my thinking with you all. Thank you.